Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Uh, when I opened up the scriptures uh, to prepare for uh, Sunday's homily, and I read those words, I knew precisely what I needed to preach about. Uh, I think every priest or deacon must have had the same experience. Some of us will punt on it. We don't want to preach about tough things. Uh, I don't have a problem preaching about tough things, so I'm not going to punt. I will talk about abortion today. Uh, some background to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a prophet that's sent uh, with the worst possible news that there is. He has to prophesy against the king and the, the false prophets that are in Jerusalem and tell them all, because of your sins, you are going into exile in Babylon. For this, they want to kill the prophet Jeremiah. They actually have him uh, thrown into a cistern. Mm. The prophet Jeremiah is also the author of the book of Lamentations. Um, they're all the, uh, the weeping and woes as he sees Jerusalem being destroyed and the people led away into captivity. Um, interesting for us is that Jews, uh, religious Jews, still use uh, the Lamentations of Jeremiah when they keep the feast that commemorates the destruction of the first and second temples in Jerusalem. Western Christians, that's us, uh, we use the Lamentations of Jeremiah in the liturgy uh, during Holy Week as we approach the passion of our Lord and the destruction of the true temple of his body. Right? Uh, so I want you to keep in mind that theme of weeping and lamentation. As we turn to the gospel, how quickly the, the town people who knew Jesus, they, they saw him growing up, they know who his mom and dad are, how quickly they are moved from being amazed at the gracious eloquence of his words to being consumed with fury and wanting to cast him over a cliff. Uh, this fury has a, um, ultimately a demonic origin, right? Uh, it's, it's the fury that consumes a person when you've given yourself over to sin, uh, when you are uh, no longer want to hear the truth. For the same reason that they wanted to kill Jeremiah, God's prophet, uh, they will want to kill Jesus because he speaks the truth in the midst of the world. You know, when, um, <clears throat> when the question of abortion uh, really hit the national scene, what was it that we were told? Well, we need to save women from back alley abortions. We need to save them from the unsterile and the difficult things that sometimes brings about their deaths. And that's why we need it to be legal. The other reason given was, you know, well, there's those cases of rape and incest, you know, and they should have uh, the ability to choose what they're going to do. Mm. Well, the cases of rape and incest don't even statistically account for 1% of the some 54 million abortions that have been performed in the United States since Roe versus Wade. They, they statistically, they're not even significant in the conversation. Um, as far as saving women from harm, anyone who thinks uh, that by legalizing abortion, you have saved women from harm are absolutely deluded. Uh, we send away our young men and now our young women to serve in the military, and, and they, they experience terrible, horrible things. They're sometimes forced to do terrible and horrible things, and they come back and they are never the same. They are changed forever by what they have experienced. This is what we've done to the women of our nation as we've convinced them that it's a, a right to choose and that it's a matter of women's health care. We have destroyed their very souls and hearts. I've been in post-abortive uh, ministry, Rachel's Vineyard. It's a great organization. 
it's run everyone who runs the retreat they are persons who have had an abortion or helped someone procure an abortion and so they've gone through their own healing process and they provide it everything's confidential they call in the priest for a few things mass and confession um, and you hear the stories of what these women had to go through um, as a priest I deal fairly often with um, abortion in the confessional do you have any idea how difficult it is to convince a woman who's had an abortion that she is forgiven that Jesus' love is greater than even that if I give her the worst possible penance I could think of um, if I tried my utmost to make it fit the crime, I would only reinforce for her uh, how horrible the thing is that she's done. Right? And if I give her a light penance, well, then it's too easy. She got off, off the hook too lightly. She hasn't done enough. She will continue to punish herself. It takes a long time to come to terms with it. We have done nothing to help women in legalizing abortion. And now, in New York City, New York State, we have the legalization of abortion, the removal of every single possible restriction. You can, form, you can perform an abortion while the baby is being delivered. That's legal in our country. In the history of the United States, and it is a checkered history, um, we've had things that as you learn them, you wonder how possibly could that have happened to a nation that at least at one time uh, prided itself on being a Christian nation. When you learn how we treated native peoples, you think to yourself, how was that possible? And we say never again. When you learn about the history of slavery and the lingering of segregation and the Jim Crow laws, you think, how is it possible that a Christian people could do such a thing? Where were the voices that cried out for uh, these things not to happen? And we say never again. Future generations will look back at what we have done in our nation if there are any future generations and uh, they will wonder how it is that we as a nation somehow decided that this was an okay thing that we were helping women somehow by allowing this we're hurting them okay how do we deal with it? We do not allow ourselves to be consumed with the fury that we heard about in the gospel. Um, there is a fury that is around abortion, and it is also demonic in its origin. All you have to do is watch the women's march. The screaming and yelling and filthiness of it all the hatred and fury in it. Right? Or just go watch one of the, um, the videos of them signing this new law in New York State as they were smiling and rejoicing over having passed this law that removes every possible restriction. It's demonic. When we deal with abortion... Our purpose as Catholics is love for the children who have been aborted and love for the mothers who have aborted their children and love for those who perform abortions. They will wake up one day and realize the full extent of what it is that they have done and they will need our love to come to healing. We should not be consumed by hatred or fury, even for the politicians who push it. That is not our purpose. 
Our purpose is to love in the middle of it. There's a few other things I think that we need to change along with it. Uh, we cannot just be concerned with pro-life, you know, when a priest stands up and gives these kinds of homilies, you know. So we pray for a couple of days and then go on about our lives and forget it. We cannot be concerned with pro-life only on election day, right? That seems to be when it pops up all the time, right? Um, I suspect there's some political motivation in that. We cannot be merely concerned with the birth of children, but we must be pro-life in all of its aspects. We need to have the kind of community uh, that helps as much as we can to provide resources for pregnant mothers uh, to get the medical care that they need. We need to help them with providing shelter and food and clothing, the basic necessities for their child, and a warm and welcoming community for that child. One of the things that goes along with this is we need to completely remove from our idea of Christianity um, the contempt for which we treat unwed mothers. That must be done away with. It is the Catholic faith that at the moment of conception you have a unique individual person made in the image and the likeness of God. Mothers and fathers merely provide the material for that conception. And in that moment, God makes the soul out of nothing. Therefore, however wrong the means of becoming pregnant, God chose in the middle of it to bring something good out of it. So you go to confession for the sex outside of marriage, and then you come to the church and we rejoice over your pregnancy and the life that is growing within you. I'll even bless the child in your womb. Um, if we can remove that stigma, I'm pregnant and I don't want anyone in my church to know because they're going to talk about me. They're going to look down upon me. I can't tell my parents because they'll be so disappointed, perhaps even kick me out of the house. When we do those kinds of things, we're not being Christian and righteous. We're providing them reasons to listen to the falsehoods of the world that leads to the road of abortion. So we need to remove that way of thinking and acting and speaking from the way that we address um, these kinds of things. Okay. Um, we should be lamenting and weeping like the prophet Jeremiah over the death of all of these children. Um, when we think about it, a, ch a child brought into existence who never gets the opportunity uh, to open their eyes and, and see the world, the sun and the moon and the stars and the mountains, never to experience those kinds of things. What a tragedy it is. Um, I used to think, you know, never for the child never to know the embrace of, of their mother, to never know the love of another person. But God tells us through the prophet Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Those children were loved. They were the beloved of our Father in heaven. We lament just like the Jews who lament using Jeremiah over the destruction of the temples in Jerusalem. Just like us Christians lament over the destruction of Jesus' body, uh, the true temple. These children were intended to be temples of the Holy Spirit. And so we can use Jeremiah's lament and our lament for them. Uh, finally, a, a word to those who have had abortions. There's always some among the congregation. Jesus loves you, always has, always will. And his love is bigger even than abortion. 
The greatest sin ever committed in the whole history of the world was that one right there. The putting to death of the innocent, only begotten Son of God. And what did he cry out from the cross to those who brought it about, who were mocking and insulting him in the middle of it? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His love, his grace, his mercy is greater than anything that we could possibly do. He laments only over one thing, that we take so long to turn back to him and receive his grace. If you have family members uh, who finally get to the point where they can open themselves to you, that they've had this done, please, please let them know that they are loved, that the church is waiting for them, that priests everywhere want to absolve them. Um, they may not take you up on it. It's a lot of hurt. It's real hard to come back. I, I can't imagine the courage it takes to walk into the room and say these kinds of things to a priest. Many of you uh, will not come to your pastor for confession, right? Because you see me all the time and you're worried about me remembering what you said. Look, I'm too busy taking care of my own sins to really worry about keeping tabs on yours. I really don't. And quite frankly, as far as I can tell after four years of priesthood, we all pretty much sin in typically the same ways. So most of the things that you're worried about, I've heard at least a thousand times or more, right? You can come to me. I will absolve you. I will help you. I'll give you the resources that you need. But if you don't want to, that's okay, I understand it. I know Father Charlie and Laughlin will absolve you. I know Father Amaro and Needles will absolve you. I know Father Matthew and Kingman will absolve you. Please go and see a priest. We just want to help. That's it. So, um, finally, this is what I, um, I want to ask of you. Uh, about a week ago, we had... Uh, a pro-life table in the back asking you to consider to spiritually adopt uh, uh, an unborn child in danger of abortion. Uh, if you did not do so, I ask you to put your money where your mouth is, those of us who believe the Catholic faith. Contact the office. We'll put you in touch with Joe Anderson, uh, who's the, uh, the head of our pro-life uh, group. And we'll, we'll get you the prayers and the things that you need to do, the practices, so that you can already begin to pray for these children. Secondly, I will ask you to pray for the mothers who have had abortions, the fathers uh, who have helped it. Uh, pray for them that they will find God's mercy and love and be healed at the very uh, depth of their hearts. And pray for the doctors who perform these abortions, that they too might turn to the Lord and be healed from it. Um, with St. Paul, we say, love never rejoices in wrongdoings, but neither does it brood over them. Love bears all things. It's patient and kind and gentle. Faith, hope, and love these three things remain, and the greatest of these is love.